Good evening, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I want to introduce myself first because most of you won't know me. I'm Jenny Morgan, who uh, I am currently the Interim Dean of uh, Melbourne Law School while the university engages in an international search to, to find a replacement dean. Um, and so on behalf of the Melbourne Law School, it really is a great pleasure to see you all here tonight on a another cold Melbourne winter's night. Um, I particularly want to acknowledge our distinguished guests this evening, Justice Gordon, Justice Haynes, Justice Maxwell, President of the Court of Appeal, and Solicitor General uh, Richard Nile. Um, I'll introduce our guest speaker, Professor Baranger, in a moment. Um, I should apologise right now for my lack of French accent. I just <laughs> don't have it. Italian maybe, but... Uh, uh, I, I'll try not to make that mistake. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Laureate Professor Emeritus Cheryl Saunders, who's sitting down here, who you'll see later on in the evening because she's going to uh, run the Q&A and give the vote of thanks. Uh, Professor Baranger has very generously agreed to take questions, so that is coming up. Um, uh, so... Uh, I would also like to acknowledge that we meet today on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, we pay our respects to their elders past and present. Um, moving on to the mundane, um, the lecture is being recorded and photographed. If you don't want to be recorded or photographed, can you speak to Dorothy? Um, who's over there, um, and uh, she'll blot you out or remove the photos. Um, and, and the usual warning, which sometimes I forget about, um, is turning the mobile phone off. Um, so can you just check your phones? So um, I just want to give you some very brief background to the series. Um, tonight's event forms part of the Magania Distinguished Visiting Fellowship Program, which enables overseas scholars of international distinction to make an extended visit to the university and contribute to the university's academic intellectual life. Um, the uh, Magania Distinguished Vis Visiting Fellowship Program arose from a recommendation by the Russell and Mab Grimwade Magania Fund Committee, the body responsible for managing the Russell Grimwade request. Unfortunately, Sir Andrew and Lady Grimwade are not able the last minute to join us for the evening. So I want to say a very a few brief words to introduce uh, our speaker, Professor Baranger, before I invite him to deliver this evening's lecture. Uh, Denis Baranger is a professor of public law at Université Panthéon Assas, or Paris 2. I can manage Paris 2. Uh, since he's been there since 2001. He's received uh, several prizes and distinctions. His first book was awarded the François Fouré Prize in 2001 and he's been elected to the Institut Universitaire de France. Uh, Professor Baranger studied law in Paris, Cambridge. He's held uh, a number of visiting uh, positions at various prestigious institutions, including Melbourne Law School, um, the University of Oxford. He's also twice been a visiting fellow in 2009 and 2012 at St Catherine's College, Oxford, and a McCormick Fellow at the Edinburgh Law Faculty in 2013. He's given classes and presentations in many institutions uh, in America, Asia, apart from the ones I've mentioned. Uh, in Paris, uh, Denise, co-director of the... <laughs> this is really going to get me. Uh, As Institute? I was about to say grazie. Um, <laughs> uh, merci. Uh, Michel Villet, Paris 2's uh, uh, Centre for Jurisprudence. Um, 
He's also been very involved in developing a research partnership with Yale Law School, my alma mater, um, resulting in conferences held both in Paris and Yale and a summer school taking place in Paris. If that wasn't enough, um, Professor Baranger is also very active in French public service and in policy debates. He has notably been a member of the French National Assembly's Committee on Constitutional Reform uh, from 2014 to 2015, and he regularly comments on public issues in the media and has published widely in both English and French. We're very proud and very grateful to have Professor Baranger this evening to present the Magunya lecture and share some of what he knows about public law. So uh, please welcome Professor Baranger. Thank you very much. Let me begin by saying how deeply honoured I am to speak in front of you today. I am very aware, as well as very pleased, of the privilege bestowed upon me. I am very grateful to the Russell on Mab Grimwaite Megania Fund Committee to have elected me to one of its fellowships. It is not without all that I have perused the list of former recipients and speakers. I cannot begin without also expressing my gratitude to my friend at the Melbourne Law School. My connection with the MLS goes way back. I was here some time ago, as you, as you mentioned, in 2001 as a visiting scholar. 16 years ago, actually, I wrote to Professor Cheryl Saunders, whom I had met in Paris, asking for advice on where I could do some research for a new book. Cheryl immediately uh, invited me to come to Melbourne with her usual empathy and generosity. The dean at the time was Professor Michael Cromelin, to whom I also wish to say thank you. Finally, I also wish to extend that gratitude to the Center for Comparative Constitutional Law on, on the, its director, Professor Adrian Stone, who is somewhere who's here. <laughs> uh, then and now, the Melbourne Law School is one of the most welcoming and vibrant civil communities that I can think of. Let me now turn to the topic I have chosen for that lecture, boundaries of public law. Some of us are professionally called public lawyers. What exactly is our trade? What is it exactly that we do as public law professors or sitting judges? What is it that makes what we do special and meaningful? In this presentation, I will use some shortcuts. The main one is that when I refer to public law, I will mean the public law of only a few legal systems in continental Europe, mostly France and in some common law countries, mostly the UK and Australia. As a result, the words public law will not refer to some sort of philosophical idea or concept. Um, also, I will insist on resemblances rather than differences. Dealing with these sample jurisdictions, I will try to identify a common pattern of public law at the risk, which I acknowledge, of underestimating the differences which sometimes run deep between the national cultures. Rather, my purpose will be to show that having a public law brings about some rather similar consequences in countries whose legal system display obvious structural differences. But I must first show that public law has become a somewhat universal phenomenon. It's gone global. It's all over the place. In our time, public law seems to be everywhere. It has become a global phenomenon. It is maybe not necessary to emphasize that France has had an active administrative law system for some time now. The rise of modern administrative law is generally dated from the 1830s in the 19th century. A major move has been the shift from an administrative law theory in which the minister, uh, the executive minister, was held to be the judge to one in which the Council of State, which was at the time a council to the executive on the crown, has arrogated for itself a full primary jurisdiction over public law litigation. This has been achieved by one of the greatest French cases, the Cadeau litigation, 1889. But public law has also thrust roots in part of the world where it was, if not unknown, yet not a central feature of the legal system. The obvious example is the common law world. Take the UK, for instance. The history of administrative law in Britain is markedly different from that of the French droit administratif, in fact, for a long time, the English system developed under the assumption that it had nothing resembling a droit administratif. Yet, this assumption has been long defeated. 
Gaston Gez, one of the main French public lawyers of the Third Republic, and a contemporary of Dicey, had seen very early that the claim that there was no droit administratif in England was misguided. My learned friend, Professor Dicey, he said, makes the claim that there is no administrative law in England. Yet, administrative law, he continues, consists of all the special rules governing the functioning of public services. In England, continues Jez, those rules exist. It is not possible that they should not exist." End quote. Since at least the 1930s, the claim has been made with success that Britain had indeed a body of administrative law. This claim is now pushed back in time retrospectively by the work recently done by Paul Craig in his Hamlin Lectures in 2014. Craig has shown that England has had a body of legal rules concerned with putting constraints on public administration for at least 400 years. This goes some way towards proving that Gaston Gès had been right all along. One of Dicey's core claims, namely that public officers on the Crown were not acting under a body of rules separate from private persons, and as a result that there was no administrative law in England, was deeply incorrect. Be that as it may, these historical bases have been superseded by modern developments. The story of the rise of modern administrative law has been told many times. In fact, it is remarkable that this should be a story at all. Public law, as a literary style, incorporates its own narratives. It is literally filled with such stories and narratives, often recited by judges themselves. Lord Denning, who was an excellent story storyteller, has such a story to tell in a famous case relating to the nature of public law remedies, O'Reilly versus Macman. According to Dennis, to Denning, sorry, Dennis, that's me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> according to Denning, there was, quote, at one time, a blackout of any development of administrative law. The curtains were drawn across to prevent the light from coming in. It was not relieved until 1952 uh, with the showcase, unquote. Whilst the darkness still prevailed, he continued in a very uh, romantic language and fashion, we let in some light by means of a declaration, <laughs> referring to the great landmark cases of the 50s and 60s show, Patfield and Isminic. He went on to say, uh, quote, we allowed this case to go forward because otherwise persons would be without a remedy for an injustice, end quote. And then in 77, in 1977, by some sort of miracle, uh, quote, the blackout was lifted the curtains were drawn back, the light was let in. Our administrative law became well organized and comprehensive. It enabled the High Court to review the decisions of four inferior courts and tribunals and to crush them when they went wrong." Unquote. In fact, many other chain novels were written about other developments in the law, such as in England, the story of taming the prerogative, also, the narrative, <laughs> since, since Miller, is the narrative of the rise of procedural fairness over the ashes of natural justice, or the mythology of bringing, bringing rights home up until the Human Rights Act. But in any case, the narratives create the objective reality of the law. Nobody discusses anymore that there is an administrative law in Britain. And of course, Britain is not uh, the only one concerned. I will not offend my expert audience today by reminding you how a robust body of administrative law has arisen in Australia since at least the pioneering opinions of Justice Dixon and Justice Latin on through the refinement of the theory of jurisdictional error. There could be many such national examples, but as a matter of fact, the narrative has now expanded beyond state borders. There is now a whole new field of global public law which encompasses a vast number of transnational administrative bodies exercising regulatory functions beyond state borders. They include international organizations established by states, such as the United Nations, uh, the, or, uh, the, uh, the WTO, World Trade Organization, a range of transnational regulatory networks, such as the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, supervision or the not-for-profit bodies that assigns internet names, the ICANN, and finally, uh, uh, of course, a growing number of international courts on dispute resolution mechanisms. It would seem fair, therefore, to say that public law has become a general phenomenon in the world, that it has no boundaries anymore, even where there were cultural obstacles to its rise. For that reason, maybe, 
So discussion about the defining features of public law has never been so active. It has been recently dominated by a very powerful proposition that public law was to be understood by its foundations. The main proponent of this view is of course Martin Lachlan in his influential book, Foundations of Public Law. He has attempted to retrieve the foundations of public law in what was mostly a theory of public law as political law. He uses the French droit politique. That is the law of the state and the law of power. I do not deny that Lachlan excels at providing a foundational structure for public law. This foundation may be called the constitutional element in public law, or if you prefer, the constitutional foundations of public law. I find it more difficult, however, to follow Lachlan when it comes to explaining that we generally mean what, sorry, what we generally mean by public law in a modern context, namely the framework of administrative action by the state, the blooming field of regulation, or the judicial review of administrative action. There is reason to think that modern administrative law has not evolved out of a foundational process. De prima facie, it is not easy to relate the intellectual background of this development of administrative law to the kind of foundational process expounded uh, in Lachlan's Foundations of Public Law. This transformation has been, for the most part, unanticipated. The great authors of the philosophical canon that Lachlan so skillfully analyses envisage a modern state which was mostly based on legislation. In this corpus, the role of the modern judge as the third giant in the state was not really anticipated, and if so, mostly in a subordinate and mechanical fashion. Nor, for the most part, was the shift toward the primacy of case law foreshadowed. Hobbes or Rousseau, or Baudin or Hegel, would be surprised and most probably disappointed at what they would see in modern public law, namely judges running the day. A foundational approach to public law takes the risk of looking only at what the intellectual founders envisaged in their blueprints, while underestimating uh, an anticipated development, the twists and turns which have brought us where we now stand. As a matter of fact, a common feature of public law systems in the world is the rather spontaneous way in which they have developed. In the jurisdictions I have already mentioned, especially France and the UK, this dimension of public law has not, I suggest, evolved out of the kind of foundation that Lachlan envisages. In fact, it has not evolved from any foundation at all, in the sense that its development is not foundational in nature. In other words, you don't get to understand uh, public law by searching for its foundation, but by identifying its boundaries. This will be the purpose of, of what follows. In this lecture, I will make two claims, two main claims. One is about the external boundaries of public law, and especially of its relation to private law. I will suggest that public law has emerged in a process of differentiation from private law. The second claim is about the internal boundaries structuring public law. I will, uh, I will uh, contend that there are two sides to public law. A technical side, which consists in the pursuit of a greater rationality of administrative action, and the political side, which consists in the pursuit of autonomy, both individual and collective. This distinction will not, not only serve an analytical purpose. With the example of Brexit, I will try to show that the triumph of the project of rationality in public law has concealed the relative failure of the political project which I will not frame in terms of democracy, as in the critique of a democratic deficit, but rather in terms of political autonomy, for reasons that I will explain later. Let me begin with my first point. It might seem trite on the part of a French lawyer to insist on the distinction between public and private law. Yet, this distinction gives us, I would submit, the key to the concept of public law. Let me just say uh, a very few general words about the public law-private law divide by way of what I would call um, boldly a framework of interpretation. Firstly, about this divide, you can't define its essence philosophically, or you can't come up with a conceptual definition. In fact, you can't delineate it except by way of casuistry, case, uh, case per case. When doing so, you are stuck in a dilemma. More case help 
uh, delineate the shape of the demarcation line, yet this often comes at the cost of greater conceptual confusion. Yet, it will not do to simply say that the divide does not exist or should not exist. However persuasive the arguments showing that it is based on mere ideology and has no real substance. This indeed has been the claim of, the, of many proponents of the American realist school uh, and later of critical legal studies. These critical arguments point very interestingly to the utter lack of conceptual clarity or, st or stability of the public-private law divide. But they have never challenged it successfully. The divide survives. Critics never prevail. This is mostly, I would contend, because the private-public law divide is institutionalized. Uh, in France, for instance, by way of the doctrine of the autonomy of public law, which is a twofold doctrine. It means first a procedural autonomy, a special body of public law courts, uh, with at the top the Conseil d'État, the Council of State. And second, a substantive autonomy, a special body of public law rules. In the UK, through the jurisdiction of the High Court and some specific remedies made available through the single mechanism of the application for judicial review, or in Australia through the mechanism of Article 75 and 76 of the Constitution. What can you do then to understand better the private public law distinction? I will suggest you can explore its genealogy and show that public law is derived from private law. I will call that a process of differentiation. What do I mean by this word, differentiation? The key word here, uh, sorry, the legal identity of the state is found in this process. The state manifests itself in the process by which it struggles to distinguish its own rights, prerogatives, immunities, etc., from the private right that govern relation between private person. The state's power thus appears in the negative as simply a power to derogate from, the private, from private law on private arrangements. It is derivative in the sense that you need to know what private law is before you can identify the derogations from it that characterize public law. The legal word for this in France is derogatoire. It doesn't translate very easily uh, into English. Rules of public law derogate from rules of private law. They appear as deviations from the private law rule. To quote from a major French public lawyer from uh, the 1960s and 70s, Jean Rivero, quote, administrative law, said Rivero, consist of all the legal rules that derogate from the ordinary law, droit commun, by which he means the civil code. All the rules that govern the administrative activity of public authority, unquote. Another word that would deserve a closer look here is that of prerogative, the French word, that has nothing to do with the British prerogative. As a French term of art, prerogative de puissance publique are powers special to public authorities. In contract law, for instance, one such prerogative consists in the power to alter unilaterally the content of a contract. Another one, very important, is privilege du préalable, the privilege of first action. It is the power to, for the administration, for the state, to execute its own decisions without needing to have recourse to a court order or injunction, as opposed to private persons. What does this tell us? Maybe that the sacrosanct autonomy of public law is one which has been gained from a pre-existing body of law, call it common law, private law, civil code. As a result, the primacy of public law, as evidenced by derogation on prerogative, is not absolute and foundational. Let me take as an example one of the most famous French public law cases. It is generally accepted that the birth of modern administrative law can be dated from an 1872 case named Blanco. Uh, uh, the Blanco case stands as authority for uh, what was previously called the autonomy of French public law. The ruling in Blanco stated that, quote, state liability in torts cannot be governed by the principles of the civil code which regulate the relations between two private persons. Uh, it is governed by special rules depending on the requirements of public interest, unquote. In fact, as the Blanco ruling would suggest, Public law is lateral to a whole body of private law, which in fact it presupposes. The state presupposes an existing civil society, and um, public law presupposes the code civil. This is far from being only a French phenomenon. Differential judicial protections in the world of Sabino Cassese, of public bodies and civil servants, is a common feature of British administrative law as well. 
But despite this common approach, the mental world and the intellectual mechanisms could not be more different. France has not moved away from the Belkoulou ruling uh, uh, as far as state liability in tort is concerned. Conversely, the British Crown Proceedings Act 1947 aimed at treating the Crown as an ordinary litigant and thus at bringing it into the orbit of ordinary law. Yet this statute is evidence of a bygone era in which differentiation was somewhat resisted. This has been called the strategy of private law constitutionalism. But this strategy was challenged in the following decades when several large-scale scandals such as the Critchell Down affair showed that when a statutory power was at play, neither the tort of trespass nor any other private law action would have given a remedy. In fact, both the French and British systems have sometimes created the differential judicial protection, uh, to use again the words of Cassese, of administrative action, and even by using a similar language. Nowhere, however, is the lateral, non-foundational nature of public law more evident than in UK law. However intense the review of administrative action in the UK might have become, it has not lost some of the core features that made it, in the famous word of Stanley de Smith, sporadic and peripheral. It remains sporadic, these are my own words, it remains sporadic despite the rising quantity of applications for judicial review because it is court-based and then inherently casuistic. It also remains essentially peripheral because to quote from the words of Lord Wilberforce in the Davy case, public law is a part of the common law. On the common law, I quote, fastens not upon principles but upon remedies, unquote. Both the French and the British case thus seem to support my contention that administrative law does not stand as a foundation for the rest of the legal system. Uh, don't misunderstand me. This doesn't mean, in my view, that it is secondary or unimportant. I said earlier on that the rise of public law was based on a lateral or peripheral process of differentiation. This is by no means to say that public law matters less than private law. This has, however, been the claim of certain trends of political and social theory, especially uh, by the Austrian uh, 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 economist and philosopher Friedrich Hayek and his followers. This may also be the risk of, of what I've, I have called private law constitutionalism, I have spoken of earlier on, reducing public law to a species of ordinary law. This is by no means what I contend. I am a strong contender of what I would call the dignity of public law, for reasons that I shall now spell out. Let me now move to my second claim, which regards the nature of public law itself. What is its internal structure? I will suggest that there are two sides to it, to public law. The technical side, which consists in the pursuit of a greater rationality of administrative action, or public action in general, I should say. And the political side, which consists in the pursuit of autonomy, both individual and collective. This distinction will, I hope, help me sketch the future of public law, and especially what will or should happen at a global level. I would submit thus that public law is woven of two fairly different strands. The first one I will call the autonomy side. The autonomy side is concerned with how power is generated and allocated. It is the law of sovereignty and delegation of sovereignty. It relies on what has aptly been called a set of power allocation methodologies which are based in law on which regulate the distribution of power to the various branches of government. The second strand that we call the rationality side of public law. It is concerned with the pursuit of rationality in the exercise of public powers. This you may also want to call administrative law, although this requirement of rationality can also be imposed on legislators and parliaments by way of constitutional review, for instance. The rationality side is mostly concerned with the limitation of power. It deals with the way in which public authorities exercise their power over the legal subjects. Do they abuse power, and if so, how can they be checked? Let me take a few examples of how the pursuit of greater rationality in the exercise of public power has driven public law in several jurisdictions. The rise of this side of public law in the UK has been a resounding success. Since such totemic cases as Anismenic and GCHQ, the construction of public law has coincided with the building of an extremely refined analytical framework of administrative action. This framework reads as a requirement imposed on public authorities to act rationally. A magnificent example of what I would call this general requirement of rationality 
is to be found in Lord Diplock's and Lord Ruskill's typologies of the ground of review as spelled out in the British GCHU case. As I said earlier, the move toward the control of the exercise, as in GCHQ, uh, of, as was prerogative, uh, but, uh, of public powers in general, as opposed to its legal pedigree, uh, has greatly furthered the rationality project. It has amounted, in the world of Sir John Laws, to an insistence, quote, upon fair play, consistency, on good reasoning, unquote. I will not go into the most recent discussions on the grounds of review in British law. Let me just say that the rise of proportionality and or, <clears throat> excuse me, the rise of proportionality and or the new interpretation of the Wednesbury reasonableness test would seem to lend support to my contention. The Wednesbury test, for instance, seems to have shifted from Lord Green absurdity test to a very sophisticated account of what agencies should and should not do in order to act rationally. The French legal system has also been remarkably apt at developing this side of public law. This has coincided with the refinement of the requirements of legality in judicial review. Let me just mention the widening scope of administrative acts which have been subjected to judicial review. A good example in the recent past is the creation of the soft law doctrine in France. Last year, in 2016, the Conseil d'État, which is our top administrative court, has for the first time agreed to review regulatory measures enacted by independent administrative agencies, quangos, basically, which neither those acts neither changed the law nor altered the rights of burden or all burdens of individuals. There may have been, for instance, simple press bulletins to the financial market or warnings issued to a cable TV network. These were not administrative acts, these were measures of a regulatory uh, fashion. Uh, yet, those measures have such a massive impact on the market actors, especially on the financial market, for instance, that after much consideration uh, on delay, the Conseil d'État decided it would review their legality after all. They did not change the law, but the legality, but the legality would be reviewed nevertheless. Another important development consists in the greater intensity of review in many cases. For instance, the quasi-permanent state of emergency that France lives in uh, since uh, the end of 2015 has been accompanied by several court rulings of the Conseil d'État to the effect that emergency powers should from now on be subject to a full intensity control as opposed to a lighter degree of review, which was the case because of the very discretionary nature of those powers. Finally, administrative law beyond the state has very much followed the patterns I've already described. It has been based on the creation, sometimes ad hoc and haphazardly, of systems of remedies deemed necessary to prevent the abuse, the misuse of powers. In an off-sighted uh, ruling of the arbitral chamber of the International Court of Justice, Electronica Sicula, sorry, <laughs> very poor uh, Italian accent. Uh, <laughs> Electronica Sicula. <laughs> uh, it was held that a foreign investor should not, quote, be treated by a state uh, with a willful disregard of due process of law, which would shock a sense of judicial propriety, end quote. My claim from this point on is fairly simple. The rationality side of public law has been successfully developed over time. The autonomy side, however, is not in such a good shape, although the greatest dangers to public law come from this state of underdevelopment. What I'm saying right now may be understood as a plea for a more political reading of public law as such, or maybe for a better articulation between the concern for rationality on one side uh, on the requirement that what is done in the public sphere takes place in accordance with the general will on aims at furthering the ideal of collective autonomy. Yet, wherever it has developed and thrived, both at national and global level, public law is faced with a political problem, which I have tried to express in terms of um, autonomy. The problem exists at many levels. In France, while courts have increased their level of review of a state of emergency measures, this has not uh, meant that the overall framework of emergency and terrorism powers has been held to be satisfactory. The role of Parliament, despite an increase of its statutory involvement, has not significantly increased. 
Courts cannot pass judgment on the merits of most terrorism measures. At best, they can scratch the surface and crush the most shocking illegalities. In global administrative law, uh, to, take, to take one example, the same kind of political deficit has been often decried. For example, critics make the point that the WTO decisions are often predetermined at meetings where only a limited circle of negotiators is present. In sum, the glorious rise of the rational side of public law, making public powers accountable for administrative action, should not make us underestimate the political side of things. I prefer to express this in terms of autonomy rather than democracy. Let me explain why. This is not to say, of course, that democracy is not one of the goals pursued by public law. Yet the theme of a democratic deficit in the EU, the WTO, national constitutions, on the corresponding remedy of, say, more democracy, do not seem to have done much good. Neither has the persistent call for the building or the acknowledgement of a demos or of demoi for the EU, the WTO, uh, or more recently the Eurozone, for instance. I think the problem runs deeper. If classical democratic mechanisms don't do any good to cure a democratic predicament, it's maybe because public law is not only concerned by the traditional cogs and wheels of representative democracy. There is an underlying concern in public law for self-government. That's what I call autonomy. Self-government, legislating for oneself, governing oneself, of which representative democracy is only one aspect. Let me take to finish a conspicuous example, Brexit. Whatever Brexit is, and this is obviously an ongoing process of which we have only seen the first episodes, I believe it can be interpreted in, terms, in the terms of the rationality versus autonomy divide I had just pointed to. Think for one second of pre-Brexit Britain. Ever since the fact of time litigation, the UK was in many regards the model boy, the model student of European Union law. Courts, as well as lawmaking bodies, had faithfully adjusted to the core principles of primacy and direct effect in EU law. Few countries, if any, we are fulfilling so obediently the requirements of the European Courts of Justice rulings on more generally the demands of EU law. Yet, the political crisis was looming. Whatever you might think of British Brexiteers, their political ideology reads as an attempt to reclaim self-government, i.e. autonomy. This attempt may be misguided in many ways. Uh, it was based on propaganda, if not uh, on all-out lies, uh, from time to time, it displayed the worst possible kind of populism. Also, it has set the autonomy claim at the wrong level. Its proponents certainly underestimate the fact that going it alone has simply become impossible for, for EU member states. But its relative popularity with the electorate shows that there is something legitimate about it, as collective autonomy stands at the very core of modern politics. This is something that the proponents of global law should always bear in mind at the risk of facing new disasters of Brexit amplitude. At the same time, EU law, which did extraordinarily well on the rational and technical side of public law, has fared very poorly indeed from the point of view of the requirement of autonomy. The law of the EU may be extremely good law, I think it is, still it is not the expression of a general will. There is no such thing as the European political community aiming at collective autonomy. There might be a European Parliament, European laws. Uh, um, the law of the EU is not the expression de la volonté générale in the terms of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. This poor record is made obvious by the very weak and misleading claim that EU law has become a constitutional order. I think that this is not the case. While the EU has been called a constitutional order uh, by the case law of the ECJ, what it really is, is a legal community of a higher order. The use of the constitutional vocabulary seemed to bring to completion a move from a contractual understanding of the EC treaty to an objective one, in the world of my uh, inter international law colleagues, or even to the claim that what was initially a treaty had muted into a constitutional charter, in the words of, of the ECJ, in the Lever case. This whole vocabulary refers, in fact, to the rise and continuing consolidation of certain legal characters of the Union, the core principles of supremacy and direct effect, the EU as, quote, uh, uh, this is from um, uh, a famous ECJ case, 
a complete system of legal remedies and procedures designed to enable the Court of Justice to review the legality of acts of the institution, unquote. This might be constitutional in a certain sense, but one which, however, uh, however legitimate, sorry, has somewhat negated the political import of the word constitution. A constitution is an instrument of self-government. It is nothing else. Uh, and the Lisbon Treaty does not qualify as an instrument of self-government. Uh, in this light, the European treaties, and especially the, and especially the Lisbon Treaty, don't deserve to be called a constitution. I now reach my conclusion. Brexit and the current state of the EU as a legal and political project seem to support my view that the development of the rationality project in public law, so popular with the bench on academics, has not been able to prevent the great crisis public law has fade, faced sorry, in this context. If, as a transnational community of public lawyers, we fail to take into account the political side of uh, public law, we will be faced with more new landslides of the kind evidenced by Brexit. As this lecture is drawing to a close, I will not conclude by pretending that I can come up with a simple solution to bridge that chasm. The absence of solution is, it seems, embedded, incorporated in the system. The very idea of separation of powers, for instance, prevents courts from meddling with politics and policies. The future, however, may reside in simply acknowledging the issues I have tried to identify. For instance, relying on courts or on administrative bodies to solve political problems when parliaments ha have thrown the towel, thrown in the towel, sorry, seems to have become a fairly standard reflex in our systems. Yet, when it comes to self-government, no amount of judicial review, no further refinement of the remedies or of the typology of grounds of review could possibly further the value of self-government on political autonomy. I should also add, add that the traditional mechanisms of constitutional law, such as political accountability, have not proved up to the task either. Maybe the future belongs, in some cases, to a blending of constitutional remedies and administrative procedures. Let me give you a last example. In France, the newly appointed Edouard Philippe government of Mr. Macron, President, has decided to legislate massively by way of ordinance, ordinances i.e. administrative measures based on a legislative delegation. But these are orders in council, uh, in, 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 in the British parlance. With other colleagues, I have suggested that this ordinance, uh, the ordinance procedure should benefit from an internal process of what is called in the US notice and comment. This is not the case at all in France positive public law, except in some Specific, specific statutory fields such as environmental regulation. Yet, this would be a possible cure to the danger of seeing those ordinances, which are meant to reform heavily the job market, being rejected by public opinion on face strikes on public demonstrations. At the end of the day, the future of public law may rely on giving a greater place to politics in to law, or rather on acknowledging that it has always been there. Politics, I would submit, is the new frontier of public law. Thank you very much. Denny, that was a very ambitious project, <laughs> uh, covering the most enormous amount of territory. Uh, and very skillfully uh, and uh, uh, executed in a highly sophisticated way. So there is a, an enormous uh, amount uh, to talk about, um, not only tonight, but uh, for the remainder of your time here. Um, we also have uh, quite a bit of time for questions, which is a good thing. Uh, so can I throw it open to the audience? Who would like to start? Yes, Jason Furuhouse. Oh, and would you uh, tell us who you are and where you come from, Jason? I really, I really enjoyed that, and in particular, I agree about uh, acknowledging the diversity of 
of, of public law and eschewing unitary conceptions of it, which are always destined to fail, I think. However, I want to perhaps present, you presented a narrative of English legal history with which I had some, some uh, qualms with. And I suppose the ultimate point that I want to make is that whether you think there was a conception of administrative law in England depends on how you define administrative law. So in England, there were no administrative courts, no special administrative jurisdiction, no concept of public or administrative law as separate from private law, and there was no administrative law of liability. Private law applied equally to public and private uh, person alike. You had the prerogative writs. However, for example, Shirshirare was specifically concerned with controlling the jurisdiction of inferior courts. Mandamus was very much concerned with restoring officials to their offices. Right? They weren't general public law controls as such. And in fact, De Smith saw it the other way around, that the existence of the prerogative writs was a reason for the non-admission of an idea of administrative law in England. So were there special rules governing officials? I think there were some. Does that mean there was a body of administrative law equivalent to, say, France? Definitely not. Uh, and it's also unclear what the conception of administrative law is there if you say that there was a body of administrative law that existed in English law. Right, shall I answer this? Shall I answer this yes, one? Please. Thank you very much. Um, really, it's a question of narrative on the, of the concept that you have of administrative law. Um, I'm not married uh, with the expression uh, administrative law. All I'm saying is that it's, 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 it's quite false and misleading uh, to, say, uh, to say with Dicey that there was no administrative law at all. If you look, for instance, <clears throat> at uh, uh, um, the amount of uh, judicial review that was taking place uh, since the Renaissance, all the figures are in the Hamlin Lectures in, uh, of Old Craig. Um, there are a lot of them. If you look in the statute book at the amount of regulations of public action, especially local public actions, there were many, many statutes to um, uh, supervise, organize, uh, cons put constraints on the action of the sheriffs, of the justices of the peace, of the uh, people dealing with the sewers, uh, the uniforms, uh, etc., the cities, the, co the corporations, etc., etc. Um, probably this was not a French type administrative law, but there was certainly um, the idea that the royal courts of justice were there to control the use of public powers in the country. Uh, then again, you may or may not want to call that public law, but when you had the prerogative writs on the way they were made use of, when you had this whole body of statutory enactments to the effect that uh, um, uh, there was uh, uh, central control over public action over the countries. I don't have a problem with calling that public law. On all I meant to say, on that, I think this is trite, this is not very original on my part, all I meant to say that the dice here counts to the effect that basically ordinary law was governing the functioning of, of the state or executive government is, is misleading. Um, then again, it is not to say that there were not... Um, very uh, structural differences between, say, France and on, on, on England. Uh, it, it is to say that um, there was a framework. Uh, I also think that we, we have to take in, into account the fact, on this may be bridge the gap between you and me, that this framework was not satisfactory. Take, I mean, uh, Antic versus Carrington. This is an important case that has for a long time been quoted both to say that actually private law was running liability, <laughs> state liability in torts, and that there was some degree of control over, over uh, public action on, on, on the state action in England. Um, the approach to, to legality in Anthony Carrington, I call, can you please show some ID? <laughs> what is your pedigree for, for acting? Where is the statute or where is the common law power or the prerogative power, which is a foundation for the action? Do you have it? Okay, I'm not, I'm not, uh, the, the courts are not going to control the exercise of, of that power. This obviously had to change, and I think this was a big hindrance on, of the, de on the development of a, of a modern type administrative law. So I think actually both narratives um, um, can obtain 
And I think it, I'm, I'm perfectly okay with bridging the gap between my own view and yours. <laughs> and I hope we will in the future. Thank you. You know, I was uh, thinking both as Denny was talking and then when Jason asked his question. You know, with comparative law, you have two options. You can look for similarities at one level and you can look for difference at another. As a person who's a difference person, and I suspect Jason may be in this category as well, I sort of get my kicks out of difference, but I also very much admire the capacity to <laughs> sort of bridge the divides and to see patterns of similarity. So this is not to say that you can't plumb the depths for difference here, but, uh, but, ju but just to say there are two genres of, uh, of comparative law uh, on the track uh, here as well. Adrian Soon, did you want to say something? Hello, Ad Adrian Stone from the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies. Thank you so much for that. Um, my question is really a question that really I'm interested to see if I understood you. And I'm thinking about the overall architecture of your thesis. As I understood it, I think you posited two goals, aspects of public law. On the one hand, it seeks to achieve rationality, on the other hand, it seeks to achieve political autonomy, which is key to its legitimacy. And so I, I was just wanting to, if I've understood you right, um, to, to ask you a little bit more about um, two things. First of all, do I understand you to say what seems plausible to me, which is sometimes those two things are in opposition? So sometimes the best law is not the one that is the most uh, that, that serves the political project the best. The, the law that, that, that um, satisfies on the sort of axis of rationality might sometimes not be politically acceptable. If that's the case, then maybe the project of constitutionalism is balancing those two. And how is that done? Do you see it as institutionalised so that the political branches are the branches of, uh, uh, of the political... Um, of, it, of, of the political legitimacy and autonomy element and then the courts are the rationality uh, institution or sometimes would, for example, a court need to make a sort of strategic, pragmatic departure from rationality in order to secure proper political values? Thank you. These are very good questions, so we need to <coughs> think them over. But uh, basically, yeah, I mean, I've, I've uh, insisted through the very structure of my paper uh, on the opposition. Then again, I think, if, uh, I think that the, the concept that unites rationality and uh, uh, autonomy is legality, on maybe jurisdiction. I mean, the fact that in, in all the systems I can think of in public law, the key notion is, has legality been followed and uh, do, the, uh, do the administrative powers who uh, are reviewed, uh, uh, were they uh, intravirus or ultravirus? Did they have jurisdiction? What is jurisdiction really? Is the, it's the fact that uh, there was a foundation in, say, a statute, for instance, uh, for the action of the public power, which is then reviewed. If legality was a straightforward concept, if jurisdiction was a straightforward concept, you could say uh, that there is a bridge between autonomy, co the collective decision, say, uh, the sovereignty of parliament and statutes, and the action of public powers. And probably that was a blueprint uh, of judicial review. You check whether actually there was a pedigree for the action of a certain public power. If you look into the history of, case, of cases that I have um, stated in my presentation, you see the way in which legality and jurisdiction have, have, have become very arcane concepts, and it's very difficult to see the autonomy element in, say, anismenic, uh, in, in proportionality, in, in, uh, in, in modern Wednesbury reasonableness. You see the way in which, actually, I think there's been a divide, there's been a gap between what has been decided in, in, in Parliament on the way in which the legality of administrative action is being controlled. Probably this was inevitable. Probably the technicality in judicial review was inevitable. Probably it was not at all a straightforward process and a straightforward uh, control to check the legality of action. But I think that the problem is, is, really, is really here. I could also discuss the, uh, the notion of discretion, for instance. To me, wherever there is jurisdiction, there is discretion. But wherever there is discretion, there is a leeway for a public power 
to, uh, to detract from uh, the authorization it has received, the legality that it has to abide by. So I think, uh, basically, I have insisted on the opposition to show that uh, I, I'm not going to mention a figure, but 75% of what is dealt with in judicial review is not exactly about collective autonomy, but about a duty to act rationally. I, I, may, I may be stand corrected in this, but this is my approach to this whole body of cases in France, in the UK, and maybe in, in other uh, jurisdictions. What you say about the institutionalization is fascinating, and we need to think about it. I don't think so. I think there is rationality everywhere, and I think there should be collective autonomy everywhere. I think, for instance, I, I've tried to, uh, to map out this distinction in, in, in what I knew uh, of public law. In France, it is generally said in 101 classes in public law that there are two aspects of public law, constitutional law, administrative law. It is almost a spontaneous reflex to say that, uh, that um, administrative law is more concerned with rationality. I don't think so anymore. Like I said, constitutional review by constitutional courts is very much about the rationality of the action of parliament. What is the outcome of that? It's a fact that, for instance, in France, where we have a constitutional court, parliament is reviewed as if it were an administrative body. And the political element in Parliament is dwindling for that reason. So, no, I, I, my reflex would be to say that it's not institutionalized. But then again, I would need to think about it. It's a very good question. Thank you. Thank you. Kristen Rundle, Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies as well. Um, Denny, I'm glad you're here for a little while because there's lots of threads of that talk that I'm sure many of us would like to um, tease out a little bit more. I think a good part of my question was just answered then in your exchange with Adrienne, um, insofar that I was assuming that the implications of your uh, plea for a greater attention to the political side of administrative law or public law would be implications for the source of the power that authorises executive action. So it's a plea for legislative activity in that particular sense and certainly not um, non-statutory executive power. But I was wondering with respect to you going down the autonomy line, which sounds right enough to me, and distinguishing it from a democratic deficit style critique, whether you ultimately end up in the same place. It's a, in terms of the solutions or prescriptions that you may be asking for here. In so far that we're not just asking for greater procedural possibilities within decision-making processes, such as notice and comment or other forms of participation. So democratic deficit concerns at the level of subjects' participation in decisions affecting them, but something more profound, which goes to the quality of legislative activity that authorises public action. Am I right to take those... Um, both of those points from you, that firstly we are, that the autonomy argument goes to ultimately to the quality of legislative activity that authorises public action and concerns we might have about securing that quality in our respective systems. But secondly, that ultimately those prescriptions are going to be similar whether you run the democratic deficit argument or your autonomy argument. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Let me put it this way. Uh, um, I'm closer to Jeremy Waldron than to John Griffith. <laughs> you, see, you see what I mean? I won't surprise you by saying that. Basically, um, uh, when, uh, when I mentioned the dignity of public law, <laughs> I was evidently referring to his book on the dignity of legislation. Uh, uh, so I agree. I think uh, legislative activity is in turmoil. I mean, we have a problem. Uh, with legislation, we don't know how, uh, how to legislate well, and I don't know how to legislate either. Uh, I'm very aware that uh, the lacuna or the weakness of my argument uh, uh, this, um, today it, uh, is as far as the propositions are concerned. And I'm not saying that I'm coming up with an agenda of restoring, of restoring uh, collective autonomy that would be too bold and too audacious on, on my part. I was just trying to spot the problem, to, to find the, uh, um, what, what was going wrong with public law. We, we uh, revere our judges, we revere our precedents, we revere all those cases in which through and through 
rationality side uh, has been incensed, we should have a look at the other side, at the political side. This is really what I want to say, and Brexit is just an example. The Trump phenomenon uh, in, in the US is basically uh, another example. Uh, okay, if this, is what they and if this is what they claim, I would agree with that. I would not agree with, uh, with a large part of the democratic uh, deficit agenda, for instance, the creation of a demos or more uh, parliamentary activity, more parliamentary control, more better representation, that sort of thing. I think uh, it's, a, it's a dead end, basically. It, ha <laughs> it has been done. It has been tried. In, Europe, in the European Union, for instance, the fact that we have a European Parliament, whether well elected or not, with good representation or not, with accountability or not, changes nothing to the fact that it does not express the general will. You see, you see what I mean? This is where I, uh, you can see in this way the way in which maybe I'm more of a Republican than a, a radical Democrat. <laughs> To be perfectly honest, radical democracy is about bridging the gap between the people and government. I think this gap exists for better or for worse. What I'm saying is that things have to be done to um, uh, uh, make sure that collective autonomy is not forgotten in the process. You could be a perfectly good classical Republican and have the same agenda as me. That's what I'm saying. Struggling with the same problem here. I mean, the solution is presumably not just the courts sort of showing deference and rolling back, because if the autonomy side is not working, then that's no solution uh, either. Uh, and uh, if you give up on legislatures, then you're left with either with the executive or with direct democracy. Uh, so there are various lines that we might follow in that regard. But uh, Justice Gordon. I'm not sure what I'm a judge, um, and I plead guilty to rationalism. <laughs> I also plead guilty to pragmatism. And so I was wondering whether you, you, in your idea that there had to be a bringing together of the rationalists and the political aspect, whether you'd ever consider that there's a difference between the civil system and the common law system. And I this one. So in the common law system, as judges, we get to live it up what we get to live it up. And that's what we're given. We have no ability to inquire in the way in which the civil system is able to inquire. And I wonder whether you've given any thought to whether the, rest, the process of the melding or the bringing together or the bridging the gap will be different <coughs> between the two systems. To be perfectly honest, uh, I don't think that there is much difference. Uh, I, I would say that, I mean, as far as my own uh, presentation is concerned at least, I would say that the problem is not with judges or with precedents, but with the attitude of public opinion on the attitude of academics towards uh, precedents generally. Then again, the, the problem seems to be the same in, in, in terms of uh, the approach to politics, uh, the limitations of uh, uh, the bench towards uh, uh, politics. I've always been quite impressed. I don't know if that, uh, that's a proper answer to your question, and I'm sorry if it isn't, but I've always been quite impressed with it, with the following fact. When I read UK law, when I read American law, what I see is, is a very clear cut distinction between the deductive mode on policy arguments. You see where there is deduction, and you see where um, policy arguments are popping in. This is quite clear. Uh, on this is it because you have opinions on you wh when you have statutes you uh, did, uh, make deductions from them and then when a, p a policy argument has to be used it is quite self-evident that there is a shift from deductive mode to to policy arguments I think on uh, the um, I admire that uh, I think that this is a good way for courts to say basically we um, have what the American called the fidelity principle. We have to be faithful to statutory enactments. But then again, we can't always be faithful when there is nothing <laughs> to be faithful to. And we have to understand the wider uh, um, problems. In France, though, it's not the case. In France, we have syllogism, very concise, very uh, short precedence, a few lines sometimes. 
even in our constitutional courts, in which actually you cannot tell apart the deductive mode from policy argument. And I think it's meant to be so. It's a way to say that basically in France, courts are the state, because we do have a state. Courts uh, um, enjoy the full authority of the state. I'm always saying to my students that the, that the French Conseil d'État is independent because it's powerful. It's, it's even more powerful than politicians. I don't think this is the case either in the UK or respectfully in Australia, and I think it's a good thing. I think the bench has to be on its side of, of the separation of powers on uh, um, the state, and politicians have to be on the other side. So I think basically, uh, then again, I'm not sure it's the right answer to your question, but I would say that culturally, there are ways for courts to have the right approach to politics and, and to policy argument, which is to say that they are using them and to say that they are referring to policy arguments or not to statutes or to, uh, to text generally. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Hi, my name is Neith and I'm from Monash Law School. And I just have a question that is based on your comment that there's, there's a chasm between rationality and to autonomy. And my question is twofold. So the first is... Twofold. Sorry, twofold. I'll, I'll take yeah. So um, my first, the first part is whether there is a desire um, in Europe to bridge that chasm. And the second fault is, can you comment on whether having a United States style of um, Bill of Rights whether that could bridge the gap between the two as it would kind of bring in, sort of rein in um, legislative activity that reflects collective will um, into a, a, a legal framework where it can be regulated. Thank you very much. They are very good questions. Uh, um, to be honest, I don't know the answer to the second question. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> to be very straightforward. Is there a desire on my part to bridge that chasm? I don't know. I, I, I don't have any desires here. I'm, I'm just trying to state things as they are, uh, as, as faithfully as possible. Obviously, I'm not happy with the state of things as, as, as they stand. Uh, uh, I want public powers to act rationally. And I think that actually uh, uh, pub public law has done very well in this regard. We are much better off with the success of this rationality uh, project uh, than if it had not existed or failed to be perfect. I, I don't want irrationality to prevail in public law. <laughs> That's self-evident. At the same time, uh, probably I want uh, collective autonomy to be more respected and taken care of in, within public law itself. Then again, I'm not John Griffiths. I'm not saying this is all false. Uh, uh, these are all a question of forces in a Marxist way. I'm not saying this. I'm saying that actually politics is a part of the law. So politics has to be tracked where it is in the law, in precedents, in statutes, in reasonings. If we do that better as academics, we will improve the bridging of the gap. One of the issues about rationality and its, its uh, uh, battle with autonomy is the starting premise that, that laws and particularly discretionary exercise of power are rational or are fair when many times that's not the intention of either the legislature necessarily um, or the repository of the power. And that maybe part of the problem is the starting assumption of rationality and what it might um, can I okay, take that as a comment? Do you agree? <laughs> right. <laughs> no, th thank you very much. I would agree with that. But um, then again, I think that uh, discretion is a part of jurisdiction. And I don't think that, uh, uh, that you actually can see places at which there is jurisdiction without some leeway for public authorities. On when there is some leeway, there might be irrationality, but you, you can't push it too far. I think that's part of the uh, legitimacy of the 
of the rationality project. Uh, fully rationality is impossible in, 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 in the Western world, in, in, the, in, in, in the law as we understand it. Uh, total irrationality is just unacceptable. So it's, it's a, it really is a question of uh, how, how not to push it too far, I would say, but your experience is greater than mine in this regard. I, I, uh, I uh, very much respect the project of rationality and very much respect the notion that when you give power to uh, authorities in general, there is a chance it might be misused. So this project is very legitimate indeed. Then again, uh, there is a certain um, extent to which you have to accept irrationality when it is legitimate. <laughs> but the higher up it comes, uh, the higher the acceptable level of irrationality. I was just wondering, actually, sort of reflecting on Richard's question, um, you know, if we are hoping that the autonomy side of things might not just be legitimate um, and reflecting the general will, but that it might also have an element of rationality uh, in it, so that it's to bring the two bits together, I just wonder whether there's more of an expectation in the French system that it will be rational. Um, you know, the, if I think about the way in which we think about what Parliament might do, there's no particular expectation that it's going to legislate in a general way, there's no particular expectation of legislative certainty. Um, whereas my impression, although this may be the grass being greener on the other <laughs> side of the fence, my impression is that you have higher expectations in France of the legislative output whether that is actually realised or not. Yes, but I think this is a recent development uh, since the uh, precedence of the Conseil Constitutionnel. It used to be the case before the Fifth Republic in 1958 that um, Parliament was sovereign, really. We had a written constitution, but there was no constitutional court, so the uh, actual principle in public law was that statutes uh, could not be reviewed. So if statutes could not be reviewed, Parliament could do anything. So I agree with you, but uh, I was about to say, you, you would say the exact reverse, <laughs> that in France the concern was, uh, with autonomy was such at the level of Parliament that the leeway of Parliament uh, was greater, which I think was the case uh, uh, during the French Revolution. Because when you say that law expresses the general will, in Rousseau's view, it means that uh, statues are always right. They're always true. They're all, uh, they always tell the truth, and you, you, uh, you can't review that. When you say that, basically, you say that they may look irrational, but actually they're not, because rationality is on their side, and you cannot review them. So I was about to say, if <laughs> you would say the, yeah, <laughs> you'd say no, the reverse. No, I, I wasn't trying to use it as a review point, more okay. as a... No, but I see your point. More as the, you know, the standards and, to and which our and autonomous representatives should be aspiring. Um, anyone else? Well, in that case, I think I might uh, draw this uh, very... Ah, the, sorry. Uh, no, no. This week, <laughs> the French, the the French man in the room. I a question on the first part of your lecture. It's on very different issues. Um, if I may go back to um, the intriguing claim that you made about um, public law being in some way derivative from private law in the sense that we need private law first in order to know what public law is going um, to say. Um, I'm not sure if you meant public law as a whole, but at least the administrative law contract and toll the relationship um, between the state and private individuals here. It seems to me that this is observably true, not perhaps as a, I don't know if it's analytically true, if it's a matter of, an, an, uh, pardon me, if it's analytically necessary, if it has to be this way, but historically that is the way things have um, developed. Um, um, and I wonder, I don't think it's sufficiently uh, appreciated it's only in French context, perhaps because of this institutional divide that you've um, um, mentioned, uh, different people working on different sides of, um, of this separation. Um, what I was wondering is how, how do you think a claim like this would be received by your French public 
law professor colleagues, um, who are, I think, fairly aware not only of the dignity of public law, but also the dignity of their own, you know, um, uh, function and uh, rank. How, how new slash how provocative do you think it would be in a French context to say something like this, what you're dealing with really uh, presupposes the existence of a different body of law that is typically being ignored uh, on that side? I think, my dear friend, it would, <laughs> it would be received as uh, with utter disdain. <laughs> Again. <laughs> okay, I know I am really going to draw, <laughs> draw this to a close. We'll talk about this later. <laughs> far, far, far too much truth. Um, look, uh, let me bring what has been a very uh, interesting evening uh, to a close by... Uh, first of all, saying what a pleasure it is to have, uh, have Denny uh, here with us uh, in Melbourne. Uh, Michael Cromlin and I um, were the people who sponsored the uh, fellowship application uh, last year to bring Denny here, and we were absolutely delighted uh, when it was successful. Uh, it is wonderful to have him back in Melbourne again, and I, for my part, very much enjoyed uh, that elegant lecture. You know, one of the conditions of uh, a Magana uh, application uh, to bring a distinguished person to Melbourne is that we need to argue uh, that the visit uh, would contribute to the intellectual interests of the school, that not only will there be a marvellous public lecture uh, by the visitor, but that in various other ways uh, the visit will um, enhance uh, the work of uh, members of the, whichever school is successful, in this case the law school. Uh, and as I was listening uh, to Denny tonight, I thought, well, we've certainly fulfilled that side uh, of the bargain. Uh, the principal theme of his lecture was to explore the boundaries of public law. We have become obsessed with the boundaries of public law in this law school, as, as luck would have it. Uh, over the last little while, uh, exploring the boundaries between public and private, the boundaries within public law, the boundaries between domestic and international law, the boundaries between civil uh, and common law. Uh, and our interest in all of these things is going to continue with the Cambridge Public Law Conference that will be holding next year, which by chance is called the boundaries uh, of public law, <laughs> or, or frontiers of public law, well. <laughs> My frontier is your boundary. <laughs> uh, so that um, um, it was a fascinating lecture from that point of view. And then in the course of exploring these boundaries, then he managed to raise a series of issues, all of which have been agitating us in one way or another, public contracts, Brexit, soft law, governance in the public interest, the character of the organisation above the state, uh, and so on. So on all of these and other matters, no doubt, that occur to you, this has been a very provocative talk uh, offering a myriad insights. It's been delivered by someone who's obviously deeply immersed uh, in the French system of public law, um, making him a rare commodity uh, in Australia. Um, but equally importantly, I think, from our point of view, uh, it's also delivered by someone who has very considerable familiarity with common law systems, both in the UK and here. And that's one of the tricks of public law, I think, to try and get your head into to both systems so that you can uh, pull uh, similarities uh, out of them. Uh, and in that respect also, uh, he speaks to uh, many of the interests of, law, of the law school, which is um, interested in the methodology of comparative law, comparative public law, uh, as well as the uses to which it can be put. Uh, as Kristen suggested, it's a great good, our great good fortune that we have Denny here for another 10 days or so, so that we can interrogate him properly. Uh, it was a very good idea to have the lecture at the beginning of this period, <laughs> rather than at the end, uh, for that purpose. Uh, so, can I ask you to join with me in thanking him, not just for delivering the lecture uh, tonight, but also for his generosity in answering the questions. Thank you.